Hey there, this is Rick. I hope you're having a great day. This is a little video that I've been meaning to put together for at least 18 months, um, but I finally got around to doing it. And this is my van build video. Now, when I built my uh, van into a camper van, I took photographs as I went along, step by step. And I'm going to be presenting all of those photographs in this video uh, from start to finish. And I'll be talking you through all the processes that I did in order to get my finished camper van, which I use today. Now, if you've ever thought about building a camper van for yourself, uh, hopefully this video is going to be for you because you should get some good ideas. This, this is actually my fourth um, proper build. And uh, so along the way, I've picked up a bit of experience and I'm, you know, in no, no way, shape or form any sort of expert. I'm just I'm just taking this sort of DIY handyman approach. Um, but it's certainly not, uh, you know, from an expert point of view. So I'm very much an amateur in doing this, um, but I have managed to uh, build four camper vans now. And this by far is the best one I've ever done. Um, so anyway, let's get this journey started. You might hear me tapping at the keyboard and clicking away on a mouse because I'm basically playing um, the video that I put together and I'm kind of narrating over it. Uh, so uh, excuse the little clicks and things in the background. But uh, so here we start off with my uh, current van, which is a Renault Master 2018. Uh, it's a medium wheelbase and a medium height roof. Now it started out life as a just a very basic uh, panel van. Um, here it is without anything having done to it. I think that was the day it was delivered. Um, so uh, it was basically brand new and untouched. And uh, so. Uh, you can see my other van, my old silver van uh, opposite there. And uh, that is the uh, the camper van I had before. It was getting on a bit, so I decided to go for a new one and uh, do another build. So I did some very uh, careful and technical sketching and uh, came up with an idea. And then today, this is what she looks like. And uh, her name is Guinevere and it, she looks quite pretty on the outside and very practical on the inside and i've been camping in her uh, quite a few times now and uh, she's served me really really well now fortunately this panel van was actually uh, paneled out in wood so it had a wood floor and wood sides on it so that was going to save me a little bit of money because i could utilize those in the build so what I needed to do was to strip out the wood and that was just a case of unscrewing it and it all came away and uh, left me with this kind of bare empty shell. You can see the lower half there, that's the manufacturing uh, wood panels, uh, that's how it comes out of the factory. The main wood panelling was done afterwards by the people selling it. So after I removed the wood, I decided to uh, remove the bulkhead. Now, some people do keep the bulkhead and they keep the cab separate from the living space. And that's a perfectly good thing to do. Um, it means that when you heat the living space, you don't uh, have a lot of heat loss uh, through the bulkhead area into the cab because the cabs aren't very well insulated. Now, personally, I much prefer having the cab open into the living space. So I decided to remove the bulkhead and that was just a case of uh, undoing a whole bunch of torque screws that went all the way around. And uh, there it is with the bulkhead removed, nice and easy. Now, once the living space had been built, my plan was to just install a really heavy duty thermal curtain that would divide off the cab from the living space um, overnight. So that would hopefully keep heat loss at a minimum. And that's exactly what I've done and it does work. So here we are starting with a blank canvas. It's literally just an empty metal box ready to begin. So first things first, I needed to put some roof lights in. Now, I had to think very carefully about this because I wanted solar panels on the roof. So you have to be careful where you put the roof lights so that you still have enough room for the solar panels. So I uh, did some more sketching uh, with my incredible drawing abilities and I came up with this arrangement. So I've essentially got three 100 watt panels on the roof. Um, as you can see, if I didn't plan ahead where the roof lights were gonna go, it could have been problematic. So I basically made sure that the roof lights were offset on one side or another in order to accommodate 
the solar panels. Obviously, this is quite a fundamental thing you have to think ahead of time because if you just go ahead and cut the roof lights in and try to work around that, you may find it extremely difficult to find solar panels that will actually fit in the spaces that you've got. So there are the uh, two roof light holes. I cut those into the roof just using a regular jigsaw. Now, unfortunately, I didn't take any more photographs uh, of the actual fitting process, but you just got to follow the manufacturer's instructions, build a little wooden frame that goes on the inside uh, and use plenty of mastic. I used Sikaflex to uh, seal everything in. And as you can see, there they are fitted. So with the roof lights in place, next up was fitting the windows. Now, my main concern to start with was these strengthening bars where the windows are going to be. I was really worried about how I was going to remove them, but it actually turned out fine because they're only stuck on with some sort of like foam type glue. So I literally just slipped a Stanley knife, like a long bladed Stanley knife down the back of them and they came out straight away. Obviously I angle ground, you can see at the top and bottom there where I, where I angle ground or rather my friend Austin angle ground uh, the top and bottom and they just came away so that was no problem. So then we're left with this large clear area ready for the window. So here we are preparing to cut a hole in the, um, the panel in the side door. Um, this is my friend Austin demonstrating the little frame that we had to make in order to fit around the windows. Now we're going to be fitting something called seats windows. These are uh, German made and they're double glazed. So you see these on caravans and on motorhomes and they're a lot more efficient, energy efficient and more heat retaining than the standard glass bonded windows that are quite popular um, among van builders. They're a little bit more expensive as well but they do have this panel on the back which contains uh, a roller blind and a fly screen. So these windows are glued in place again using something like Sikaflex and uh, with the the interior wooden frame and then adding the interior panel with the fly screen and everything they screw together and they pull everything tight together so you get a really good seal on the window. So here's the window fitted in place. I kept the protective packaging over the glass until the van was completely finished just to protect it because that's actually plastic glass. Even though it's double glazed, it's, it's not made of glass, it's actually made of plastic. Uh, but it comes out on these little pistons and uh, there it is on the inside and you can see the frame and that the whole thing is sandwiched together on this frame and you get a nice tight seal and uh, you've got obviously you've got the, the roller blind there and the fly screen at the bottom. Here's the window on the other side. We've just cut out the hole, just using some red oxide paint to uh, seal it up where, uh, where the cut was. And here are the windows in place. So we've got one on each side and then we've got a little one at the back, which was a terrible mistake because I can't open it. I really didn't think that one through. Don't make the same mistake as me. I put that one there thinking that it would be great to have a little window because I was planning on having the sink directly below where that window is. So it would be nice to stand there doing the washing up and actually look out of the window. But what I completely failed to take into account was if that window was open and I opened the side door, the sliding side door, the side door would just take that window straight out. So I now have to have a big sticker on it that just says never open this window just to remind me um, that uh, that's the case and there's me demonstrating the roof light so that opens now and you can see the wooden frame uh, that we had to build uh, in order to install those roof lights. So here's a picture of the finished thing so you've got the windows and the roof lights in and now we're ready to move on to the next stage. So this is the fitting of the mains hookup inlet plug and uh, decided where it was going to go. Now, when you use a jigsaw to cut out these holes, it's always a good idea to put some sort of protection over the rest of the bodywork because the, the steel plate on the bottom of the jigsaw can scratch your paintwork. So I just used, uh, I think that's frog tape, just so that the jigsaw didn't scratch the paintwork around it. So in order to do it, you drill holes at the ends of the straight lines uh, and then you cut the hole out. So back to the interior, we've now got the windows in place, we've now got the 
roof lights in place so it's time before we do anything else to think about soundproofing now i'm using something called dodo mats now these are heavy duty kind of bitumen based mats and what you do is you stick them on all of the large panels all around the inside of the van and what it does it deadens down any of the resonating sound that you get while you're driving along so here's the uh, finished result these are dodo mats on all of the flat surfaces went for a drive after installing these and it was remarkable what a difference it made you just kind of lost a lot of the road noise and a lot of the the resonating that you get from the you know the big metal panels now these are self adhesive mats and you literally just peel off the backing and stick them on so next up is insulation and the most logical place to me seemed to be start with the floor so got hold of some wood some of it was good some of it was bad that's the uh, disadvantage of buying them in bound packs had a few banana shaped ones there so the idea was to put a load of rafters down place insulation between the rafters and then cover the whole thing over with the floor that already came with the van so here we are test fitting the rafters now on the edges there were all these little moldings all over the uh, the metal floor so i couldn't fit long strips so i had to go in there and, and fit little pieces um, little custom shaped pieces but that was fine they did the trick and uh, obviously they're going to distribute the weight of the uh, the floor panel above I brought this wood, uh, which is 34 by 34 millimeters. And this takes into account the size of the ribs and the size of the Celotex. If I show you down here, hopefully you can see, this is gonna sit between ribs. So then from the top of the ridge to the top of the wood is about 26 millimeters, which means the 25 millimeter thick Celotex will sit on top of these ribs and will not protrude higher than uh, the wood which means when I put the floor in there should be a nice sandwich of insulation uh, without anything sort of upsetting anything else. So after gluing down all of the battens using Sikaflex again I started filling the gaps between them with 25mm Sikaflex. Now Sikaflex is a lovely material to work with it's very very easy to cut and it's a very forgiving material and a lot of that wasn't even glued down it was just wedged in and it worked beautifully and within a couple of hours I had the entire floor covered and uh, nicely insulated so there's the finished thing so next up was creating the vapor barrier I needed to protect the wood from any potential moisture from within the living area so I did this using metallic foil tape I think this is the kind of tape that you use on metallic ducting and I just basically covered over uh, all of the wood so it essentially acts as one large vapor barrier next up was to reinstall the floorboards and I was able to screw those down to the wooden rafters that I would glued to the floor the irony is I'd spent the entire day doing the floor and as soon as I got the floorboards down it looked like I hadn't done anything so there we go that's the floor now completed so I don't have to worry about that anymore so I can now walk around inside the van and do the rest of it now before I could add any insulation into the rest of the van I wanted to think about where I was going to put my wiring I wanted to hide as many wires as I could behind the uh, the insulation and behind the panels uh, so you know they weren't so visible now my design included all of the electrical junction boxes and controllers and everything like that were going to be on the offside rear of the van so that that was where they were all going to converge so what I did was I bought a big reel of 240 volt mains wire which was twin core positive and negative and I started feeding them from the rear offside area of the van to the other parts of the van where it needed to be distributed to like the ceiling uh, the kitchen side and up towards the front of the cab so here you can see the wiring in place I've actually started to insulate the ceiling on the right hand side that's where all the wires converge because that's where the electrical 
control panels and everything are going to be. Now in the ceiling you can see loops. That is a single piece of wire that converges on the, the right hand side there. But those loops are ready for the wiring for the ceiling. And you've got a few other little wires on the left hand side there feeding down towards where the kitchen area is going to be. They're going to be there to supply power to the water pump and the shower and things like that. Now in order for me not to get confused as to which wires are which, I labelled everything up. I just got a piece of masking tape around each end of the wires and they're all just labelled up so I know exactly which ones are connected to which. So here's more of the ceiling insulation going in. Now I used 25mm Celotex again. Obviously I was working against gravity this time so I just used a few small blobs of Sikaflex in order to hold those into place and I propped them up with a spare piece of wood while they dried overnight. Once all the ceiling insulation and the wires were in place, I then stuffed all of the little ribs and the structural parts of the van with this, I think it's shredded plastic bottles. You buy it in big packs and it's sold as an insulation. Now originally inside all of the, the, the structural parts and the ribs and everything, I was thinking a little bit about using high expansion foam because I know once it sets, it's quite a good insulator. But in hindsight, I decided not to because it's just far too permanent. And once it's in place, it's absolutely impossible to get rid of. So instead I use this insulation, which you just stuff into all the nooks and crannies. So there we go. So the shredded plastic bottle insulation, I'm hoping it's, because it's plastic, it's not going to retain moisture uh, or be problematic in that way. Uh, and it's just nice and easy to work with as well. After I'd done the ceiling, it was time to insulate the walls. Again, I'm using Celotex, but this time I'm using 50 millimeter thick Celotex. And uh, because I've got the extra space available in the walls. And uh, so again, this was just blocks of Celotex cut out in straight lines mostly and uh, stuck in place with just a few blobs of Sikaflex just to hold it in place. On a few occasions, I did need to carve out the back of the Celotex in order to make it fit into the sort of strange shapes that it may have encountered along the way. But overall, it was a really easy thing to do. Took a, took a while, probably took about two days to do in total. But you can see all the offcuts of Celotex uh, down on the floor there. Uh, and you can also see a big bale of that uh, shredded plastic bottle insulation uh, that I used. So at the moment, yeah, the van looks like a sort of a, <laughs> like a bit of a bomb site, a bit of a building site. But we all know this is not going to look like that for long. You can also see actually on the lower right hand side, the inlet for the 240 volt mains, uh, mains inlet there and the big blue wire that's going to fit to an RCD fuse box a bit later on. Also on the right hand side, you can see some black conduit. Now, while I was running wires through all of the, uh, you know, the structural parts, wherever I could, I also used conduit. That's just purely to protect the wires from any chafing, because obviously if you've got some sort of sharp metal parts, that are slowly gnawing their way through wires, you're going to end up with short circuits. So wherever I could, I did use conduit. Um, but to be honest, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I've never had that problem in any of the four vans I've built. May have just been me being a little over cautious, but I figured why not? It's you know certainly not going to do any harm. Now all around the Celotex, I was using that shredded bottle stuffing. You can see in the lower part of the door there, um, I couldn't get any Celotex there because of all the working door mechanisms. But fortunately, the, the mechanisms are actually quite shielded. They've got these little shields all over them, which meant I could get the stuffing uh, sort of in and around behind them without it actually interfering with the mechanisms of the door locks and everything. So uh, that was a good thing. And of course, it's just adding extra insulation all the time. And here you can see the same thing going on. In all of the parts where I just couldn't quite fit the Celotex, uh, I've stuffed that, uh, that shredded bottle stuffing. So with all of the insulation in place now, it's time to think about vapor barriers. Inside the living area of your van, when you're using it, you're breathing, you're using gas, that produces moisture and you do not want that moisture getting on the inside of your insulation. So what I did was I used 
large sheets of this, I think it's Mylar bubble wrap. You can buy it in large rolls. I think it's like a, from a builder's merchant. And uh, I used that everywhere to try to seal off as much as I could of the insulated areas. And that, as I say, is a vapor barrier that will prevent moisture building up behind the walls, which obviously is not something you want, because if you end up with moisture behind the walls, there's very little to no airflow. And so any moisture that gets back there is just not gonna dry out and you're gonna end up with rust. So once the moisture barrier is in, I can then start to think about adding the wood panels back again. So here I am just test fitting, making sure everything's exactly as it needs to be. I needed to obviously cut out the holes where the windows go. And uh, it was a little bit awkward because these sheets are sort of in two separate parts. So I had to sort of improvise a little bit. I also had to install these little pieces of wood uh, in the gap around the window just to make little window sills. Now for the exposed metal parts between the sheets of wood, I stuck on some self adhesive neoprene. This is kind of like wetsuit material. And what it does to start with, it forms a barrier against the bare metal which prevents the condensation of water. If you have a bare metal surface and you have moisture in the air, that moisture will condensate on that bare metal surface, particularly if that metal surface is cold. So what you need to do within your living space is not have any bare metal surfaces because like I say, water droplets will appear on them. So this self-adhesive neoprene, I think it's about five millimeters thick, uh, seemed to me like the perfect solution because it's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's a surface on which water cannot condensate. So you will not get droplets of water on it. It also, is a soft material, so it's kind of a little bit squidgy, like having a, a foam barrier, which means that those hard metal surfaces are actually soft to the touch. So that self-adhesive neoprene formed the basis for all of my hard metal surfaces that were going to be exposed. Now on top of those neoprene surfaces, I will then stick roof lining felt, which is the same felt that I'll use to cover the entire inner surface of the van, as you'll see a bit later on. So here we are. These are all the metal surfaces covered in the self-adhesive neoprene and then covered in the roof lining material. These surfaces would otherwise have been exposed bare metal inside the living area of the van. Same for on the back there. You can see that kind of archway that goes around uh, the, the back doors there. That was all bare metal. So once again, I just stuck self-adhesive neoprene and then covered it over with the roof lining felt, which was stuck on using high temperature spray contact adhesive. So with all of the detailing in place, it was time to fit the wood panels. So here they are in place. Now, what I did for the panels was quite simple. Once I knew they were the right shape and the right size, I took them back indoors and I covered them over with roof lining felt using high temperature spray contact adhesive. And here you can see where I put those extra bits of wood around the window, the roof lining felt tucks over and all around. So you end up with the roof liner felt going right up to the window surround there. Obviously the corners were exposed, but just a few little offcuts of the roof liner felt stuck in place. And those little corner bits completely blended into the rest of the roof liner felt and were invisible. So this is how I covered them in my back garden there. Uh, I just placed the panels on a large sheet of roof lining felt. Uh, obviously you've got to be careful which way round you place them in order for them to fit. Uh, because obviously if you get it the wrong way around, you're going to be covering the wrong side and it's all going to be back to front. So I I think I actually did that on one of the sheets. I actually got it wrong and it was really easy to do it wrong. So you've got to be a little bit careful, but um, once you figured it out, totally straightforward and uh, really easy to do. And, and even the manufacturer fitted pieces of hardboard, uh, they all went back beautifully with the roof lining felt on it. And I was able to put them back into place using the original push fit fasteners. Same again on the back doors there. Now for the rest of the back doors, uh, they had no wood on the upper parts. So I had to make a cardboard template for each side 
so that it would be covered over in a big piece of wood that would again be covered over in the roof lining felt. Same for the side door, a nice big piece of cardboard cut into a template and then once again that will be transferred to a piece of 5mm ply uh, and covered over in the roof lining felt. And there we have the finished thing, 5mm ply covered in roof lining felt in place on the doors making sure it absolutely minimizes all of the exposed metal surfaces. Now, unfortunately, it appears I only took two photographs of putting in the roof or the ceiling. Now, in my previous vans, I always used large sheets of five millimeter ply that was covered over in roof lining felt, but it was always a really difficult job to do on your own. And because I was on my own, I opted for a different option, which I know a lot of other self-build camper van people have opted for in more recent years and that is to put cladding on the ceiling wooden pine cladding and I think one of the reasons why people opt for it is it is so much easier to install because you're only putting it up one thin strip at a time as opposed to handling these huge great sheets of plywood so that's exactly what I did for the ceiling I just put pine cladding into place one piece at a time using self drilling screws that went directly into the ribs running along the van obviously not directly into the roof skin of the van because that would put holes in the roof anywhere where there weren't any ribs available and the ceiling had nothing to press up against i would normally glue a wood batten into place unless i could screw it into place without obviously piercing the roof skin so these are the only two photographs i've got of the pine ceiling uh, after it was done. I obviously wanted to get on with it and I've completely forgot to take snapshots as I went, but here are the two pictures of it done and obviously with the lights in place and working as well. I've also put the, uh, the floor liner down. So uh, this is a, an off cut that I managed to find. It was two meters wide by two and a half meters long. And although it's kind of missing at the back, that doesn't matter because um, literally the living space is only going to be sort of from here forward so you're not going to see that all that's going to be hidden by this that's going to be um, the, the main bathroom is going to be on top of that so we've reached that stage in the van build um, that I, I always love this this stage in the build where you've got all of the the essential stuff out of the way um, this stuff is sort of fairly routine stuff and it isn't that exciting. In fact, this is this is all of this so far has been the boring stuff. Um, it's sort of necessary but quite dull to do. So from here forward, it gets more exciting because now we've got this blank canvas ready to be filled, so we can actually start concentrating on working on the interior space. You know, uh, I can start building the shower and the bathroom now. Uh, I can start looking into the kitchen cabinets and actually really get active now with the um, the stuff that's going to be inside the van and for me that's always my favorite part of the build. So first things first was to install the bathroom. For this build I decided to get a proper shower tray for a camper van that has a molding for the shower and the toilet but I had to be very very careful as to where I could install it so that the drain hole could go through to the other side. Below that shower tray is my spare wheel and that straight away would restrict where the drain hole could go so I had to have a really good look around underneath to make absolutely sure that there was space for me to be able to do that. Now you can get these molded trays in a left or a right hand version. So I essentially had four chances to make this work. And as it turns out, after looking underneath the van, the only option was to get the left hand version. And the only place I could get a hole through to the bottom of the van would be in the lower right hand corner that you see in this photograph here. That was the only position I could put a hole through to the outside and still have enough space to fit a drain plug. I drilled a test hole. Um, it was impossible to determine exactly where it would come out the other side. It was it was almost impossible to measure. So there was a little bit of trial and error. So I drilled a hole and as you can see underneath it came out right on the edge of a rib. 
which was okay. I could work with that because I could cut out from that hole the circle that I needed in order for the drain to fit. Now these plastic molded trays are actually, they're quite thick, but they're also, it's quite a brittle plastic and there's a lot of airspace underneath them. So you sort of have to build up this little framework underneath just to support them into place. So I've got some off cuts of wood and built up this little sort of shape um, that would support the, uh, the plastic structure so that when you're actually standing on it, you're not gonna crack it or break it. Now, the length of wood that you see sort of on the right hand side in the middle area, I stuck them together with some self adhesive neoprene. Now, that sort of did two things. First of all, it stuck the wood and held the wood in, in place together, but also it made it slightly cushioned so that when you do step on the shower tray, there's just that slight cushioning going on there rather than sort of rigid plastic. It seems to have worked extremely well and uh, it does support the structure of the, uh, the tray, which you see here. I also needed to install a couple of little blocks of wood under the lip of where the toilet was going to sit, just to, again, for more reinforcement to make sure that there was not gonna be any stress or undue stress on that rather brittle plastic. So here you can see the toilet is in place, the, uh, the shower tray is down, I think it's glued down using Sikaflex, and uh, you've got the beginnings of the bathroom structure in place. Now I'm using stud wood, standard stud wood in the UK, I'm not sure what size it is, just kind of from memory I think it's about an inch and a half by about three inches, um, might be slightly off from that, but um, you can get hold of it nice and cheaply and it's a really good medium to work with it's nice and strong it's not too heavy and so i decided i would make the entire bathroom structure using this stud wood so here it is from the front and there's the structure starting to take shape obviously i've got a doorway into the cab and then a, a kind of like a stud wall on the sides and at the front in front of the loo there and obviously i need to build a wall across the back as well the main structure is slowly taking shape now. We've got a bit of a cupboard on the left. That's going to be a stuffed cupboard for bedding or whatever else you want to put in there. The little area above, that's going to be for all the, the wiring. And obviously below that cupboard, you can see the battery there. And obviously below that is the wheel arch. On the right hand side, you can see the structure starting to take shape. That's going to be a cupboard and a place for the shower. And that's what that 10 litre Jerry can is going to be four hours. We'll talk about that in a second. There we go. Now I've actually now plumbed in the batteries. I've got one there and I've got one down there. They're two 120 amp power batteries. Um, and these are going to be connected up to the uh, charge controller, which is going to be sat on here. Now the control unit I'm using is called a SeaTech 250 something SA. Uh, I'll show you a little picture of it here. Um, now, the reason I've gone for this particular one is because I had all sorts of trouble uh, with the the standard split charge, like the Durite type thing, because I couldn't get it to work uh, with the main engine battery and the solar panels uh, on the last van. So this uh, SeaTech is designed to uh, work in conjunction with your main um, engine battery and your solar panels. Now, as it turns out, or originally I was gonna have the, the second battery up here, but they are so heavy, I just wasn't keen on having that much weight that high up. Um, it just wouldn't be good for, you know, for, for, for heavy, heavy weights. You need to keep them as low as possible to the ground. So this one's basically sat on the wheel arch, uh, but that one is on the ground um, or on the, on the floor of the van. And uh, I'm quite happy with that arrangement. I've also figured out that um, with the electrics, I can uh, put all the electrics in here. This is gonna be like a, an area purely reserved for uh, electrical wiring and stuff like that. I've got a control panel that's going here, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, now I could have covered over the shower. I've got all the gear here, but um, I, I thought I need to leave these walls open until I've at least done the wiring. Otherwise I'm gonna be trying to work through solid walls and it's just gonna make my life really, really difficult. So I thought I'll get the wiring out of the way before I clad to the bathroom and finish it off. I've actually got another wall to build across here um, in, on which the, uh, the back of the loo presses up against, etc. Now I've also got a cunning plan 
for uh, a hot water tank for the shower. Now, I've never had a running hot water system in any of the vans I've ever owned, and it's never been a problem. Um, I sort of, I did ponder on whether it would be worth getting one, but to be honest, I think um, because I've never had a problem with it and because they're so expensive, uh, I just didn't bother. I, I just didn't think I would need it. However, I did need to sort of think out how I was gonna get some sort of uh, water system to feed the shower. So I come up with this design, and this is a 10 litre uh, jerry cam. And the idea is I'm gonna have a tap that's coming from the main water feed, uh, yeah, or sorry, the main water reservoir. I'm gonna have a tap here that will feed cold water directly into this jerry cam. And the idea is I'm just gonna fill it up sort of about so high with cold water. And then from the kitchen, because this is right next to the kitchen, uh, I'll, I'll have the the, 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 the hob is going to be here. Um, I can quite happily boil up the kettle and uh, open that up and pour boiling water into there and top it up. So I've got some nice hot water there for a shower. I have built a wall. I'm still waiting to cover this. But yeah, the idea is that um, I'll have a just a, a simple self-priming 12 volt pump inside this that will feed off to uh, a shower hose or shower head. Uh, and then I can have a shower in there, no problem at all with whatever water's in there. And worst case scenario, if I just happen to run out of water and I haven't quite finished shampooing my hair or whatever, I can just reach round, top it up. All right, it'll be cold water, but I can top this up a little bit with some more water and carry on my shower. So uh, I think that's quite a good little design. Now, I have built another wall here. I can just put it into place. It's not held in place yet. Um, because I, I need, I don't want to cover these walls up until I've done the wiring because I need access to everything. But it's it's basically, it's going to have a, a storage space in here, uh, which I will cover up with uh, what probably more of the grey felt again. Um, I do have access to the battery down there when I need it. Um, there will be more panelling on there. So I could put all sorts of things in that cupboard, you know, bedding or whatever. I've got the control panel here. Uh, which is it's pre-wired at the moment but I'm gonna I'm gonna change the wiring on it because at the moment when you wire it up it all lights up and to be honest I'm not that keen on control panels that light up all the time because I get a bit paranoid that they're using electricity all the time um, but also uh, at night time if you want to leave say I don't know certain things on you know say I've got a circuit that's charging my phone up or whatever I'm gonna have a really bright light lighting the van up so i'm going to disconnect all the lights and literally just have you know on and off so i think that's the way i'm going to do it so here we have a picture of the rcd fuse box being connected up for the mains hookup and uh, that's going to basically feed a couple of 240 volt mains plugs inside the living area here's a quick little tip if you're working with those thick heavy duty cables you're going to need some thick lugs like these now most normal electrical crimping tools will generally not touch these crimpers so i had to order this crimping tool the, the handles there are almost a foot long and uh, they made really light work of everything but I only discovered I needed to order them once I'd started on the wiring work and it actually set me back two days while I waited for them to arrive. So a little tip I'd just throw in there, um, just before you're ready to do your wiring, if you're working with those really thick lugs, then get yourself a pair of these and it will save you a lot of stress. So going back to the bathroom construction, here is the first stud of the wall that I'm building right across the bathroom. So here we go, that's gonna be sealed off and uh, then I clad out the bathroom with these really thin corrugated plastic sheets that you can get quite cheaply on eBay. And they just slot into each other quite nicely. You, have, you still have to kind of glue them into place with like a clear mastic to make sure that they're waterproof. And here's the back of them. Then I just added a load more Celotex for insulation, obviously leaving the back of the loo available so you can change the loo over and uh, i put it down the sides as well and then i clad the whole thing over in pine cladding so there we go finished back wall there it is from the inside uh, all done and all looking good however this was a mistake i sort of regretted 
making a solid wall at the back of the van once I'd built it. I quickly realized this was a mistake and the penny dropped when I went to my local builder's yard to buy some six by four sheets of plywood. <laughs> I went to the back of the van, opened the doors and thought, oh, <laughs> I can't fit them in the van. So I had to put them in the side door and it was a pain in the bum to do basically because by then I'd already built the kitchen unit and uh, I ended up like really in a bit of a cold sweat trying to get them in the van. But also from a safety perspective, I just, just wasn't happy. I just wasn't comfortable with the back end of the van being shut off. I wanted a second escape route. Uh, you know, if I had any sort of trouble, perhaps a fire in the kitchen or whatever in, in the front end of the van and I couldn't get to the side door, it could be really bad. Um, so I thought, no, I, I really want an, a second option, like an escape route. Uh, from the back of the van. So um, I decided I'm going to cut a doorway into that wall. Uh, so what I did was I pulled off all of the pine cladding, uh, stripped out all of the insulation, and then I did a bit of cutting, got a jigsaw in there, and uh, made this arrangement. So I've actually got uh, a doorway, which is about five foot tall. And uh, then obviously I cut out the, the white cladding there, and uh, there's a doorway and I was just much, much happier with that arrangement. Obviously for privacy, if you're using the bathroom, well, the back doors are gonna be shut anyway, uh, so there's no problem. And when you're having a shower, a simple fix will be a shower curtain uh, going across there. I've, got, I've actually got a shower curtain that goes all the way around in a kind of a big square inside the shower anyway. Uh, so absolutely no problem with the shower or water issues or anything like that. So there we go, just kind of neatened it off a bit and then put uh, the pine cladding back again. So there's the finished thing with a doorway cut in, uh, much, much more practical. So if I need to go and buy some, you know, large panels of wood or big lengths of wood or whatever, or if I've just got to transport something big, I can hopefully get it in the back doors uh, rather than trying to manhandle it over the kitchen counter through the side door. Uh, which you'll see a bit later on. So here's a brief uh, scan down uh, with all the electrics in place. You can see those big heavy duty lugs attached to the CTEC unit, uh, which is controlling uh, my solar pan panel input, is controlling my output into the van. There's the RCD unit for the mains electricity. I've got everything on a couple of isolator switches. That isolator switch shuts off the solar panel and the isolator switch further up um, shuts off the main power to everything inside the van. So next up was the seat and bed. So it's quite a simple system of a fixed bench that also has a secondary part of interlacing slats uh, so one pulls out from the other. Um, I'm sure there's a name for this type of bed. I don't know what it is, um, but it was very, very simple and quite logical to build. A good piece of advice is don't have your slats too close together. If they rub together when you're pulling the bed in and out, um, it's likely with you know expansion of wood, etc., that they could lock together and you'll never be able to open your bed. So make sure you've got a nice thick gap between the slats um, so there's no danger of them ever touching together. But yeah, so it's kind of fairly self-explanatory. Here we go. Here's a, here's a video of uh, the bed being pulled out. It's kind of self-explanatory. Chamfered edges on the front there. Got chamfered edges on the underside of the back there as well. That's just so that there's no issues with riding up over that back bar that you see. And uh, it's a perfect little arrangement. So when you pull it out with the cushions on, uh, you pull it out, you've got basically a single bed. That's uh, about three and a half foot wide by six foot long. And uh, you can get two people on there. It's a little bit cozy. Uh, but the lip on the front of the cushion kind of helps you falling out of bed. But it's also uh, doesn't come out to meet the kitchen unit. So you've actually got a little, little bit of a gap between the kitchen unit and the bed. So you can kind of shimmy between it. So you can still maneuver around it. Although it is a little bit of a pain to leave set up during the day because it does get a bit in the way. But there we go. So that's the bed. So next up is the kitchen unit. Now this is my Mark 1 kitchen unit. 
I actually change this later on, but I will show you this design anyway. This is what I call the skeleton system, where you build a skeleton of wood and then you clad it over with plywood to put an, sort of an outside on it. And here you can see I've, I've built the basic shape. That little panel on the left hand side of the fridge there, below there is a heater uh, called a Propex. That's a Propex heater based under there. And at the front of it, you can just see at the bottom of the picture, uh, that's where the warm air blows out. Um, so basically I built this skeleton box. Uh, you can see that's from the side door. There's the back of the fridge. Um, there's room in there for two gas bottles. Uh, that's going to be the gas bottle locker. It's going to have a dropout hole directly below where the gas bottle is sitting there. There's the Propex heater I was saying about, uh, fitted in place. Um, and then it's got a shelf that goes on top of it, hides it. There's more shelving gone in there. And uh, then there you can see on the right hand side, I've added a five millimeter wood panel that's been covered over in a self adhesive wood vinyl. Uh, this is the same wood vinyl that I've used to cover the side panel there on the right uh, and the door and you can see the overhead cupboards as well on the left. So there's the back end of the kitchen unit looking through the side door. Again it's been clad over with 5mm ply that's had a wood vinyl sticker stuck onto it to make it look a bit woody and obviously a little bit of a cupboard door fitted there. So there we go that's my Mark 1 kitchen unit and I'll be completely honest with you, I just didn't like it. Um, it I just it just wasn't happy with it. You know, I, I used 15 mil Conti board uh, as the doors of the, you know, the cupboard doors there, uh, just clad over again in that self-adhesive vinyl. Um, but the fridge was too low. I had to sort of stand on my head in order to sort of find anything in it. And the cupboards just weren't, they just weren't big enough. The, the cupboards were just inadequate. Um, because that tall cupboard there on the left, that was mostly taken up with um, a 25 litre jerry can of water. And it just had a very small slither of a cupboard above it uh, that you can see when you open the door. Unfortunately, I haven't got any photographs where I've opened the doors. Um, but yeah, I just didn't, I just, just wasn't happy with it. Now, the thing is, I went away shortly after I built this uh, to help a friend build some cupboards in his camper van. And we came up with a new design of cupboard that I absolutely fell in love with. And it just so happened, I don't know whether it was luck or fate, that the Propex heater that I have in this Mark 1 version of my kitchen unit, the Propex heater gave up and it stopped working. Now, in order to get to the Propex heater, I actually had to dismantle this kitchen unit. So I kind of treated it as a blessing in disguise and it would give me an opportunity to build the Mark II kitchen unit. So after disassembling this Mark I kitchen unit, I began construction of the Mark II. Now this is using sheets of 15mm furniture board. This is not the lightweight Voringer board. You can do it in the lightweight Voringer board. Voringer board is extremely expensive. Um, but to be honest, I thought I'm going to be using such little amounts of this furniture board. I will just use the regular stuff. It's just a bit heavier. So here we have the initial construction of the Mark II kitchen unit. Now I've done away with the skeleton system of making a skeleton of wood framing and cladding it over. I'm actually going to build the, the whole thing out of furniture board. Now you can see I've already put in place the gas cylinder, uh, the diesel tank for the new heater, which I was going to fit and the 35 sorry the 30 liter jerry can for the fresh water here it is from another angle and this is it partially built now with the mark ii version with the propex heater broken i decided to install a diesel heater instead now with a diesel heater i didn't really need to have two gas bottles because all the gas bottle is going to be doing is running my camping stove so that freed up a load of space. So I was able to build a gas bottle locker that was just big enough for one gas bottle. So here is the Mark II version partially built and you can see the gas bottle locker and the locker where the fuel for the new heater, which I'll talk about later, um, and the fresh water is going. Now I managed to find some latching drawer runners, which I uh, built into the unit here and you can see them running here. And that is my table, which is ideal. And it just tucks away when it's not needed. Here's the back end of it. Now 
Now here's progress being made on the Mark II unit. Notice the fridge is up much higher than the in the Mark I version. It's also in a slightly better position, I think. So the work surface is a piece of laminated uh, MDF, which has uh, got a shiny finish on it, so it makes it quite a nice work surface. This is the finished thing. I've got some lighting in there. Now, the whole point of building this Mark II version was not to have cupboard doors. Instead, you've just got these large shelves with big lips on the front to stop things falling out. And it just was 100% more practical than those tiny little cupboard doors that I had on the Mark I version, which just weren't very good at all. So I'm much, much happier with this design and it has served me so much better. It's, it's just it's a hundred percent better than the Mark I version and uh, looks really good. They're all lit up as well. And uh, those little shelves, they're just they're just perfect. And also, if you you know you want to figure out what you're having for dinner or whatever, you can just sort of sit back and just just sit there on the seat, and everything is there available to you at a glance, and you haven't got to go rummaging around in cupboards. It's just brilliant. There we go. Just put a little bit of silver trim on it just to polish it off a little bit, and uh, that's finished, job done, and uh, ready for service. So direct comparison, there's the Mark 1 version. The fridge was down low. The the cupboards were you know really inadequate. The cupboard doors were were held on with, you know, tiny little hinges that were really delicate. It was it was just a rubbish uh design compared to this just so practical. There was no comparison. Mark 1 version, Mark 2 version. I would take the Mark 2 version every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Now if you remember, I was saying that one of the reasons I had to disassemble the Mark I kitchen unit in the first place was to get to the Propex heater because the Propex heater had stopped working. But what I also realized after I'd plumbed it in was that the Propex heater vents to the sliding door side of the van, which is all well and good. But if I had an awning up and I ran the Propex heater, the awning would fill with carbon monoxide fumes from the pro from the Propex heater. So all in all, it was a pretty poor design. So I decided, first of all, I wasn't going to use the Propex heater because it ran on gas and that meant I would have to carry two gas bottles with me uh, because obviously I'll get through gas a lot quicker using the heater. So I decided to opt to one of those cheap diesel heaters and I would fit it to the other side of the van so that it would vent out of the offside, the driver's side, and the awning would be on the near side, the passenger side. Now we are jumping around in time a bit with these photographs because I, I installed the new diesel heater before I built the new kitchen unit. So we're sort of, we're doing a bit of time travel here with the photos, but that, that's fine. So here is the heater about to be fitted. And uh, it's one of those, uh, like I say, those cheap Chinese um, heaters uh, that everybody swears by. And it runs from its own diesel tank. Originally, I was put off buying a diesel heater because I sort of assumed that you would need to tap into your main diesel tank on the van, which I wasn't comfortable with doing. But I, when I realized these things run on their own tanks, uh, it just kind of opened up the world to me. And I thought, brilliant, I can go for one. Uh, so there it is. That's where it's going to be. It's basically going to be in a box under the seat and under the bed. Uh, so I built a box around it using offcuts from the old Mark I kitchen unit. So I basically recycled the wood, which is why it's covered over in that self-adhesive vinyl still. So there we go. Just a fairly crude box. It didn't have to be anything special. It's going to be sort of out of sight under the bed. Um, but I've left a gap at the back for the airflow to be able to get inside it, but it's covered over sufficiently so that sort of nothing can uh, get in there and, and block it, uh, you know, block the airflow. So I decided to have the, uh, the diesel fuel tank uh, on the same side as the side I fill the van up with, so that obviously if I need to put diesel in the, uh, the diesel tank, I can do it while I'm filling up. Uh, that was the main reason for it, and I've got easy access to it with the sliding door. So with the heater in place, the bed back in place, the new kitchen unit built, um, we're now looking at pretty much the finished van. And I, I've obviously added little bits and pieces on, like for example, this leaf table. I used 90 degree hinges with that lock. So uh, you've got an extension of your work surface there. Q 
kudos to my friend Damon for introducing me to that design of hinge I also built some overhead cupboards very simply using the skeleton system I put a, a wooden framework in and then clad it over in five millimeter plywood and reinstalled the control panel so it was on the front there I also changed the original door on the bathroom for a sliding one which slides to the interior of the bathroom and I did that using two large heavy duty draw runners and it was a little bit awkward fitting it because the draw runners have to be absolutely parallel to each other in order for it to work properly but it was just a little bit of trial and error in order to get it to work it's been working beautifully for the last 18 months all i do is every now and again i'll just spray a little bit of silicon oil over the draw runners uh, just to prevent any issues regarding you know water from the shower and like I say I've had it running 18 months and it still works beautifully so there we go that's the finished interior I just got a little Persian hall runner rug I managed to pick up quite cheaply on Amazon and I had to cut it a little bit just to make it fit also got a throw a nice sort of Aztec -y throw to go over the caravan cushions which were a bit sort of dowdy and not a very nice color and it's kind of like got a nice homely feel to it I've got some nice sort of warm lighting going on there and I didn't want to go for some sort of ultra slick sort of modern shiny thing I wanted something that had a little bit of a I don't know a sort of a rustic feel to it um, and I think I've achieved that there and uh, I'm very very happy with it it's very cozy it's very comfortable and uh, that diesel heater works beautifully uh, so very very happy with it externally all I did was I put on a few like coach lines I changed the wheels over for some alloy ones I've got some running boards which are actually uh, plastic drain pipes with LED um, lights installed into them with the little end pieces that curve around so they actually look metal I spray painted the surrounds around where the windows are to make it look a bit more camper vanny I added a sun visor over the top of the windscreen and a stone chip protector on the front of the bonnet there just kind of makes it look a little bit cool uh, also added some running lights um, obviously on the sides and at the front there I've got some daytime driving lights and that's pretty much it the rest of it is is completely stock and uh, but it's just a nice looker and I'm very very happy with her and uh, hopefully she'll give me lots of uh, nice camping trips for years to come so there we go that is my uh, van build like I said at the beginning I'm certainly no expert in this this is just doing what I know how to do uh, this is the way I do it this van has been by far the best the most comfortable the most practical van I've ever done I've learned quite a few new things in this particular van build and uh, one of the best things I did with this one was rebuild the kitchen unit that secondary you know that mark 2 kitchen unit is absolutely so practical I'm so happy with it and I will use that method in all future van builds unless I come up with an even more practical version but I can't see that happening also the bed in my previous van builds I've always had a bit of an issue with the bed not being that comfortable but this time round I used those caravan cushions and I also made sure that my bed was longer than six foot and that's made all the difference this bed is so comfortable it's as comfortable as my bed at home uh, I've had the best night's sleep while camping ever in this particular van so I think in any and all future van builds I will be using caravan cushions even if I buy them second hand I don't care those caravan cushions are by far the most comfortable cushions I've ever slept on uh, you know in a van so I hope you were able to you know pick up maybe a few little tips or ideas or something you know along the line do feel free to use and copy and borrow any ideas that I've put out there that's why I made this video so hopefully this video will give encouragement to other people to have a go at doing uh, your own van I've waffled on long enough I hope this video was useful to someone uh, thanks for watching if you haven't already do please thumbs up and subscribe do of course feel free to leave comments in the notes below and uh, again thanks for watching I will see you in the next video until then Take care.